Welcome back everybody. Thank you for visiting the YouTube channel for bestbiblecommentaries.com. In this video, I'm going to talk about the commentaries on the four gospels from the Baker Exegetical Commentary on the New Testament series, or the BECNT series for short. Before I do that, I invite you to subscribe to my channel if you like to see videos on biblical studies resources like Bible commentaries. Clicking the thumbs up button or the like button on my videos really helps me out on YouTube, so I appreciate that. And feel free to leave a comment or ask a question down below. Also, in the description box down below the video screen, I'm going to put links to each of these volumes, links to Amazon to each of these volumes, so I invite you to use those. Before I get into sharing uh, academic reviews for each of these volumes, I just wanted to show you that the, there's actually a different cover design now for this series. Um, this is obviously not a gospel, but I'm just showing you what the new cover design looks like with the white and blue and the brown cross on the side. So all the volumes in this BECNT series are moving to this cover design. I'm not aware that there's any revisions of the commentary, so it looks like even if you found one of these used copies or if you got a new one, the content is the same. All right. Uh, the volume on Matthew is by David L. Turner. This commentary was published in 2008. It is 828 pages in length. The layout of the commentary includes an introduction. Each section has an introduction, a summary, and then the commentary itself is in the middle of each section. The introduction and the summary are both have this gray tech, gray color as kind of a background, makes it a little bit easier on the eyes. And then there's an exegesis and exposition section, which is the largest portion of each of each uh, part of the commentary. And they put the chapter and verse in the margins, and so it makes it really easy to to find things in uh, this commentary. So all of the all volumes in this set are um, structured and formatted the same. I would I call the BECNT series a mid-level commentary series, leaning more toward the technical end than the introductory end. And the reason I say that is because there's extensive interaction and discussion on the Greek text of each of these um, books of the Bible. If you don't know Greek, would you be able to um, utilize this commentary? I would say yes. You might just need to read portions of it slower just to follow the conversation. All right, the first review is from the Journal for the Evangelical Theological Society, and I'll note the reviewer on this one. It's Michael Wilkins, and he wrote the Matthew volume in the NIV application commentary series. So it's a, a noteworthy reviewer. He says about this Turner volume, this is clearly a commentary written by a committed evangelical scholar who seeks not so much to dabble with speculative theories as to provide a trustworthy tool for the interpretation of Matthew's gospel. So excellent comment. Wilkins notes that Turner provides comment on grammar and syntax of the Greek, some history of interpretation, and not as much time on theology and application. Now, if you've used the BECNT series before any volume, you know that it's really just not the focus of the authors to offer, to give the reader a lot of theological reflection or application suggestions. Those would be the purposes of commentaries in other series, but the primary purpose of the BECNT volumes and the thing that it does very, very well is exegesis. Wilkins also notes that Turner holds to a, a viewpoint called progressive dispensationalism. So it's dispensationalism, um, uh, a version of dispensationalism, which sees the dispensations as not only chronologically successive, but they are progressive stages in salvation history as well. Now, sometimes in my videos, I will say about a particular resource, I will say, this is the theological perspective of the resource. If you do not align with that resource, it'd probably be best to find uh, another resource that you, where you, you find more agreement. I would say that's not the case with this volume. Even if you are not a progressive dispensationalist, I don't know how many, a lot of dispensationalists out there, but I don't know how many are progressive dispensationalists. Um, even if you're not a progressive dispensationalist, don't let that stop you from uh, using this commentary. I wouldn't let that stop you. Uh, one other uh, quick comment from the Master's Seminary Journal. The reviewer says about Turner's volume, one is constantly aware that Turner regards the details of Matthew of Matthew as true. The reason why I think that comment's noteworthy is because 
it speaks to Turner's approach to Scripture. He has a very high view of Scripture as he interacts with the Greek text of Matthew. All right. Um, I'm going to put a, a link down below so, to a page on my website where I talk about the top 50 commentary series. I consider the BECNT series, the series, a top 10 commentary series. So I think it's a top tier series based on aggregate academic reviews. If you would like to see the full list of that top 10, or it's actually the top 50 on that webpage, I invite you to follow that link when the video is over. All right, The Gospel of Mark by Robert Stein. This commentary was published in 2008. It is 823 pages in length, and the layout is the same. The Bulletin for Biblical Research. This is an academic journal called The Bulletin for Biblical Research. states, Stein provides a well-researched, carefully written, easy-to-read commentary focused on elucidating the ancient world of Mark's gospel and Mark's message for the church. Now, I'm going to just interject a comment here because the reviewer said that this commentary is easy to read. Remember I said it's mid-level leaning toward technical. So when he says it's easy to read, it's a compliment to Stein that he writes with clarity. However, pastors and probably seminary students are still going to be the primary audience for this series. So I didn't, I don't want you to think easy to read means this is the, this is the right resource for a lay person if they're brand new to Bible commentaries, because that, that wouldn't be the case. All right. Now, continuing with the review, this commentary will be a valuable addition to a pastor's library and serve well in an upper division undergraduate or seminary English Bible course. The reviewer notes that Stein argues that Mark wrote the book. So he has a traditional view of the authorship. And he actually provides five reasons why he believes that that historical um, the historical position uh, that Mark is the actual author of the book. He gives five reasons for why he is convinced that that is true. Stein also holds that Mark was written around 70 AD to Christians in Rome, and he believes the original ending of Mark has been lost. So if you're familiar with biblical studies on Mark, you know that there's a debated passage at the end of the gospel. I think it's chapter 16, 9 through 20, I think it is. Um, and most English Bibles, there'll be a footnote or it'll, that passage will be in brackets and it will say something like some early manuscripts don't include this passage. So it's one thing people want to know when getting a Mark commentary is where does the author think of that original ending? It's very important to some people on both from different perspectives. So Stein's view is that the original ending has been lost. All right. Uh, one other link I'm going to put down below, or a couple other links I'm going to put down below. I'm going to put a link to each page on like the best Matthew commentaries, the best Mark commentaries, the best Luke commentaries. I'm going to put each of those links in the description box down below too, so you can see where each of these volumes uh, ranks compared to other um, volumes in the same on the same book of the Bible. So feel free to use those. All right, this volume on Luke, this commentary on Luke is actually in two volumes. I'm just showing you one, um, which covers Luke 1.1 1, 1 through 9.50, and then the second volume covers the, the remaining part of the gospel. Daryl Bach is the author, teaches at Dallas Theological Seminary. The uh, volumes were published in the early to mid-90s, um, this volume is a little bit newer and I mean, this volume was published first, of course, and then a few years later, the second volume was published altogether. There are 2,100 pages in both Luke volumes put together, 2,100 pages of scholarship on Luke. The first academic review comes from the journal for the evangelical theological society. The reviewer in this case is Craig Blomberg. Blomberg agrees with another reviewer who says, if you could only own one commentary on the gospel of Mark, it looks as if Daryl Bach has written it. So Blomberg quotes this other scholar in his review and agrees with it that saying, if you could only have one commentary on Luke, this is the one to have. Blomberg adds that if Bach's Acts volume, which Bach also wrote the Acts volume in the BECNT series. He says, if it's as good as this one, then Bach might just overtake his mentor, 
I. Howard Marshall as the preeminent evangelical Lucan scholar of our day. Now, Blomberg wrote that review in the mid-90s. After that, Bach did publish the Acts volume in this series, which is extremely well-reviewed. And most, I would say, most scholars would agree that Bach is today the preeminent evangelical Lucan scholar um, of our time. And he continues to publish uh, different books. Uh, he has he publishes different commentaries, but his um, primary area of expertise is Luke and Acts. Bach is evangelical. He is conservative. And like Turner, he is a progressive dispensationalist. Again, I would say the same thing. Even if you're not a progressive dispensationalist, do not let that keep you from utilizing this volume. Uh, Bach defends the authenticity of Luke, often in contrast to the Jesus Seminar, if you're familiar with that. I won't get into that right now, but when he was writing these volumes in the mid-90s, early 90s, the Jesus Seminar was a pretty big deal. And so he he argues for the authenticity of Luke, and he often does in contrast to the Jesus Seminar. Okay. And by the way, if you do like these Luke volumes, you should, um, his, his Acts volume is just one volume in this series. And so that would be a good one to pair with this Luke set. All right. Um, there's a little bit more to the story with this particular volume, uh, John by Andreas Kostenberger. And it was published in 2004. It's 363 pages in length. The layout is the same as, as the others that I have shown. At the time, Biblioteca Sacra, which is the journal for the Dallas Theological Seminary, said about this volume, it belongs on the bookshelf of every pastor and teacher interested in preaching or teaching from the Gospel of John. So when this came out, it got uh, excellent reviews. Currently, some of you may have noticed, if you look up, if you've ever looked up this, this volume before, because it's very well reviewed, um, and so people, when they realize that, they go and try and find it, and then they realize that it's very expensive. At the time that I was researching the information in order to make this video, this volume was $175 on Amazon. That was the cheapest price. So it might have changed since then, but that's what it was, um, when I was when I was making my notes for this video. And the reason why, it's because it's no longer published by Baker. So the supply is very low. The demand is very high. And Baker pulled it from publication. So I think the best thing to do is just read Kostenberger's words themselves, and then I'll make a, a comment afterward. So this is what Kostenberger says about this volume. It has recently come to my attention that there are some unacknowledged similarities between my John commentary in the Baker exegetical commentary on the New Testament series and D.A. Carson's Pillar Commentary, a problem originally introduced in my Zondervan Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary on John. While Carson's work is cited extensively in the BECNT, upon thorough review, it came to light that certain portions were not cited adequately. I didn't catch the mistakes when preparing the ZIBBC, and later the problem was carried over to the BECNT. Inadequate note-taking and substantially reducing the length of the ZIBBC content and endnotes to requested word limits likely contributed to the problem. Regardless of how those errors happened, I am ultimately responsible for them. In dealing with this issue, I've made every effort to act with utmost honesty, integrity, and transparency. I immediately brought this matter to the publisher's attention and apologized to my esteemed mentor and friend, Don Carson, telling him that any failure to give poor, proper credit was completely unintentional. I also made financial restitution to Dr. Carson and his publisher. Both publishers decided to remove these works from circulation. In working through this, I have deeply appreciated the guidance and encouragement and support of the institution where I serve and of many colleagues in the scholarly community. In preparing a new, corrected edition of my commentary and in my future academic work, I am resolved to give scrupulous attention to all note-taking and citations to make sure that the works to which I owe an intellectual debt are acknowledged to the fullest and most accurate extent. For Christ and his kingdom, Andreas Kostenberger. 
I don't know of a release date for the new volume that Kostenberger is going to put out on the Gospel of John. I am pleased, uh, this is just a personal comment, I am pleased that he is continuing uh, to publish and that he will get an opportunity to uh, publish this Gospel of John in the BECNT series. He is a very well-reviewed scholar, he's a very respected scholar, and I don't think that someone's writing career or their ministry or their teaching career um, should be should end because they made a mistake. Um, if there, this was a similar subject to a video that I did, I don't know, maybe a month ago on Peter O'Brien. And um, I wish that people would give Peter O'Brien a second chance as well. But I have not heard anything along those lines. So I, for one, look forward to the new edition of John when Kostenberger uh, publishes it. All right. Thank you for watching this video. And thank you for visiting bestbiblecommentaries.com.